All right. So again, thank you all. Welcome um, to our evening session. Um, and thank you all for being flexible as we uh, switch to this format today. Um, I am going to mute everyone that's not a presenter. So don't take it personal. It's happening to everybody. There we go. Um, we're excited to welcome our two speakers this evening um, as we start our session recording the past and interpreting for the present. Uh, starting us off, I believe, is Mr. Doug Sanford. Excellent. Um, okay. Doug is a longtime professor of historic preservation at Mary Washington and is presenting tonight um, on his research as co-director of the Virginia Slave Housing Project. Um, so without further ado, here is Doug's presentation, The Virginia Slave Housing Project, Looking Back and Forward on 15 Years of Research. Yeah, and, and good evening, everyone, and uh, thank Kakova and ASV for the invitation. Happy to participate in the public session, and I'm going to move right to my presentation with my partner here, Sonia. Mm -hmm. Technician. Hopefully this goes smoothly. And... You ready? Okay. Oop, let me go, let's go back one. <laughs> um, you're going to hear me say we a lot as I do this presentation, and that's because uh, for all the 15 years of it, uh, my colleague Dennis Pogue has been a central part of this. Um, obviously, couldn't be here, uh, but I said it, it, this reflects our, our work over all these years. And I should add uh, that we have always done this on a part-time basis um, as we've had other jobs, full-time jobs as well. So yes, 15 years, but uh, not all those, every moment of those years. Oops. Uh, here's the outline of what I plan to do tonight. Uh, so obviously an overview of the project's goals, methods, and results. Uh, then I'll uh, give you some examples of common types of slave housing in Virginia. Uh, then look to some issues of preservation. Uh, and then follow that up with what we call our success stories, which are also about how our project has evolved over time in sort of un unanticipated directions. Uh, since this is an archaeological conference, I want to make some marks as I go along about archaeology, but I'll also make some specific points at the end of my presentation about the relation of our project to archaeology. Uh, and then finish up talking about some future uh, research needs, needs, both for Dennis and I, but also we hope other people will take up the charge here. Uh, in terms of the project's goals and methods, you see those listed here. Uh, from the beginning, we wanted to compile, which hasn't been done before, architectural information from a variety of sources. So previously surveyed buildings, archeological sites, uh, period documents uh, like fire insurance policy, uh, and then also a heavy component of going out into the field and actually recording standing or surviving slave quarters. I do wanna note that the picture in the upper right of the screen, which is a famous picture of a log quarter, uh, but that log cabin, you know, one room with a loft, a wooden mud chimney, that is or was the most common type of slave housing in Virginia in the 18th and 19th century. Uh, and unfortunately, those sort of buildings do not survive well, as you'll be hearing. Uh, other goals included making our information publicly available through our website. And if people want our databases, we're happy to share them. We also encourage the awareness of slave housing's importance and why it should be preserved. Uh, and this follows right with encouraging property owners uh, and others to do the right thing by these buildings. And then last but not least is to use these structures to do interpretation to discuss issues of American slavery and racism and African-American heritage. I presume I'm uh, preaching to the choir here, but people would, you know, you know, why are you doing this? Why study Virginia slave housing? Uh, and you see a list of reasons here that I'll march through. But at the very basic level, there used to be tens of thousands of these buildings, if not hundreds of thousands of them in Virginia. So it was a very common widespread form of American vernacular architecture. It deserves study just as any other form of architecture does. I think also one of the great powers of this architecture, it materially manifests 
our country, our states, colonies, history of slavery, racism, the African diaspora. I mean, it just crystallizes it right in front of you. Uh, importantly, these buildings represent both the inputs of enslavers and the enslaved. Um, these buildings, their spaces within and around them were places of negotiation, power struggles, if you will, uh, enslavers attempting to control and oppress the enslaved and them resisting it. So these are places of oppression, but also places of cultural survival and resistance, uh, important places of Black families, enslaved Black families, uh, their lives, their communities, their culture. And in that sense, they represent important uh, resources of African American heritage and multiple stories to be to be told. Here's what we mean. Uh, these slides represent examples of getting information, architectural information from different sources. So to the upper left is a fire insurance policy of the Mutual Assurance Society of Virginia. Uh, so the, the building in the upper right corner of that slide, um, obviously labeled a Negro quarter. So we, what do we get from these fire insurance policy? Well, they show you the building's outline or its profile. They give you materials, dimension, uh, the composition of the roof and the walls, and also how they were used. Uh, to the upper right, obviously, uh, is a slide many of you might recognize from Monticello, but again, we get good arch architectural information from archaeological sites. The slide to the lower right represents us doing field survey. You'll see this building again, this uh, log quarter, and I'll talk about that. And this last slide on the lower left is actually a Habs photograph from Mobile, Alabama, obviously not Virginia, but to represent urban uh, slave housing, uh, a category that we didn't start off to do a lot with, but expanded over time, and I'll explain that. So everyone loves numbers. I love numbers. You love numbers. But seriously, uh, how many buildings are we talking about? Uh, so at present, uh, and this is a some important, reflects important work by archaeologist uh, Mark Bukowski, with a number of you likely know. Uh, we estimate there are about 1,500 uh, slave-related buildings, buildings associated with enslaved people, on file with the Virginia Department of Historic Resources, and we'll come back to that. Uh, ourselves, we gathered uh, information on 125 buildings from archaeological sites Importantly, as of two, 2012, Dennis and I sort of veered away from this, and we're hoping somebody will take up this task of updating that database. Uh, from the fire insurance policies I mentioned, we found 292 buildings. Um, and importantly, uh, a, quite a number of those are from urban and town locations, which helps explain how our project veered in that direction. And if you look at the 1860 US Census, it's the only census in the period of slavery that does this. It asked uh, enslavers, how many slave houses do they, do they have uh, or they had? And so there are, again, tens of thousands of buildings. So these are just simple counts. There's no architectural information, but you can do a lot with these counts, as I'll show you. And then from our field work over these 15 years, we have looked at documented 120 buildings. Uh, so this is a unique database uh, that we're both proud of, but also want to share. We've worked in 34 counties, uh, six cities, and you know, having this sort of database allows us to do comparative information. So you'll see there just like, for example, simple comparisons of you know, how many are brick, how many are frame, log construction. And you'll notice nearly 75% of these buildings are uh, better construction brick and frame. And so guess what? They have survived and many of those log buildings have not. Uh, many of these buildings are located close to the main house on farms and plantations. Uh, so it also reflects what we don't have. So we go out in the field and I'll do this briefly. Here's what we do. Uh, we do in order to have replicable standardized information, comparable information for every building we look at, we do a detailed uh, field survey form. We take detailed notes. Uh, we produce a planned drawing. And we also do a standardized set of digital color photographs. So we have that for all 120 buildings that we've looked at. Coming now to some common building types. Uh, these are what we call duplexes. Probably in the time period would have been called just quarters or double quarters. But these are very distinctive 
and distinctly recognizable types of slave housing. Uh, so you'll see a number of these are distinguished by having two doors. Uh, these duplexes uh, incorporated two or more slave enslaved households. Uh, so the two doors, each door opened up into a room. So if you look at that upper left slide, there's a central chimney, so a fireplace to either side. Uh, but there were partitions in these buildings, both downstairs and upstairs, to keep these households separate. Um, so these duplexes, you'll see they come in a variety of materials that I've exhibited here. If you look at the the uh, the brick one, you'll say, well, where's the second door? Well, that central window used to be the other door. Uh, so duplexes are very common, uh, both to have uh, central chimneys on the interior and sometimes in, in chimneys as well. We do find some cabins, what people would call slave cabins. So you see the log one, that one's in Stafford County that I mentioned earlier. The one below it to the lower left uh, is in Surrey County um, and it represents what we call improved slave housing. Uh, this was a movement in the early 19th century and into the antebellum era um, to, quote, improve the conditions uh, for enslaved people. But again, re please remember, this was a cold calculation. Uh, this was to keep enslaved workers healthier so they could work harder, produce more, and actually reproduce more as well. But they purposely contrasted this from a log building with a dirt floor and a wood mud chimney to something raised up on a foundation or piers to have a nice brick chimney, uh, more glass windows, et cetera. And then we also see what's another common type is a combination of a kitchen and quarters for enslaved in one building. So the two slides to the lower right are a, a urban kitchen quarter in Fredericksburg with a view of the fireplace so on the first floor and there was a room above. Uh, the upper right example is in Stafford County and the two doors are for a kitchen and laundry on the first floor. Uh, and then there are two rooms, two separate rooms on the upper story uh, for, ens for enslaved workers. So if you will, a kitchen laundry quarter. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we over time expanded into urban slave housing. Uh, this is partly due to the fire insurance policy, but realized this work uh, had not been looked at as much by architectural historians. Um, we thought it would be easy that we would just walk into Alexandria or Richmond and ask the local preservation peoples, hey, point us to five or 10 slave quarters. And that didn't happen. Um, there are fewer known and documented than we thought. Um, so I said, this is why it's a difficult topic. So the two examples you see here to the left, again, these are kitchen quarters in an urban setting uh, with kitchens below and then rooms for enslaved people up, upstairs. And, the, and these are actually on uh, two lots in Church Hill, right, right next to each other. As I mentioned earlier, these fire insurance policies, uh, many of them relate to examples of urban slave housing. And what comes out of this, yes, there were buildings that were straightforward, you know, the single use of serving as uh, quarters, rooms for the enslaved, but also what we call mixed use buildings. So, you know, more than, uh, I mean, more than with the single function of a quarter, but also a kitchen and a quarter. In fact, kitchen quarters are the most common example we see of these mixed use buildings. But look at all these other examples. I won't read all through them, uh, we eventually found about 17 different building types in which slave housing was combined with bar uh, with buildings that have other straightforward functions. And so sort of an archaeological point here, if you will, uh, you may be working, doing archaeology work around a stable or a carriage house or a laundry, and you start seeing domestic artifacts. Well, keep in mind that these you know, may be associated with enslaved people living within those buildings. Speaking of preservation, uh, this has become a familiar refrain for us. We have good news and we have bad news. The good news is there are many more buildings out there than we thought, uh, many more to be found, uh, which, is, which is very exciting. The downside is many of these are in poor condition and they are about to go. So the two buildings that you see pictured here are both gone. Um, even though they've been documented, they're, they're gone now. And again, there's a variety of threats facing these buildings. Uh, sometimes people just don't have the money to maintain them. Uh, they're no longer used, so they're neglected. They deteriorate. Uh, once they're no longer used, guess what? Insects, animals, other creatures move into them, plants as well. 
Uh, at times they are purposely destroyed and at times they're put to alternative uses. An unfortunate pattern in our view is that a number of these have been turned into upscale guest houses, uh, which usually means tremendous amounts of change, especially on the interior uh, to, to these buildings. So a little text heavy here from, apologize, but anyway, a couple other preservation points I wanna make. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier about 1,500 buildings on file with the DHR. Well, those numbers, as I'm calling them here, are a little on the shaky side. And, and you know why is that? A number of these buildings are just referred to as assumed or suspected quarters. They haven't been confirmed as slave-related buildings. Some were just, you know, if you are familiar with the phase one architectural survey, uh, these, you know, they didn't go into the interior of these buildings and they just sort of put on a form, hey, this is a one-story building, it's framed, it has a gable roof, it has two, two windows on this facade, et cetera. So not a lot of information. And the more important point, I think, Many of these buildings were recorded anywhere from 30 to 50 years ago. So a real question that still haunts us is how many of these buildings actually survive, even though they have been recorded. And this is comes into this next point, that by having these buildings simply, quote, be surveyed, be listed, physically survive, that does not equal preservation. Uh, so in a very straightforward sense, unless you are in an active way stabilizing, maintaining, repairing these buildings, they're not going to survive. A number of these people say, well, aren't these buildings on the National Register? And in many cases, yes, they are, which is a type of preservation. But I said they're often very minimally documented, usually because the survey was focused on, you know, quote, the big house. Uh, they weren't really paying great attention to these other buildings. And they're just a little bit uh, minimally documented and listed as contributing resources. Uh, from our survey, uh, our review of the files, there's only literally a handful of uh, enslaved related buildings that are on the National Register on their own merits. And more importantly, our sense of preservation is not just physical. These buildings, as I was talking about earlier in our goals, they need to be interpret interpreted uh, with input from descendant communities to properly honor enslaved African Americans, hopefully help towards restorative justice. Um, these are buildings that need to be used in this public way uh, for outreach and education on um, both issues of slavery, but the legacies of racism and, and slavery. So to bring this closer to home, we're here at beautiful Berry Hill in Halifax County. If you look in the 1860 census, the owner of Berry Hill, James C. Bruce, had 24 slave houses on his plantation here. Uh, and divide, you know, so one way to look at it mathematically is divide the 134 enslaved African Americans of children, women, and men by those buildings. Uh, importantly, uh, right behind the main house is a service wing. So for instance, this service wing would not have been listed in the U.S. Census as an example of slave housing, uh, but this Service Wing does survive. Uh, Darby's Tavern is in part of this, uh, but had a kitchen, a laundry, three rooms for enslaved workers. And this also, this Service Wing reflects the influence of, and I, and I misspelled her name, Eliza Bruce, James Bruce's wife. She greatly influenced this wing's design, we know from documents, and she supervised 27 enslaved domestic servants. So the role of white, in, white female enslavers here. Uh, we also know from previous research that there were eight stone duplex quarters in the mid 1850s here at Berry Hill at different parts across the landscape. And I'll show you a slide of the ruins of those buildings and only one survived today. And you see images of it, both as a Habs photograph in the thirties and then one I took uh, just last month. Um, so out of those 24 buildings, only one survives. So here's a weird term, survival percentage that I came up with, but here's what I mean by it, but also shows you what we don't have. Um, so if you go to the uh, VDHR files for Halifax County, uh, again, this reflects Mark Coffey's work. There's nine quarters, 14 kitchen quarters. You all do the math. So 23 buildings, which looks pretty good. But then if you, you know, noodle in, look closer, uh, Three of the quarters, six of the kitchen quarters are either demolished or in ruins. So that's nine, leaving us only 14 probable buildings for the county. 
And then let's compare that with the U.S. Census for 1860 for Halifax County, 2,671 slave houses in the county's two districts were, li were listed. And in fact, one of the districts was under candidates. So you could probably add another 200, 300, 300 buildings to that total. So you do the math, divide 14 by that, and you get one half of 1%. You know, the 14 buildings still on file with the DHR of all those slave houses listed just that one year of 1860. And I said, that's a very common result. So it just shows you how much we have lost and another reason we really need archeological research. So let me move here towards the latter part of the uh, presentation and talk about some preservation successes. And these successes are not so much ours, but of local people, local organizations. So this, the upper slide show you, it's a log duplex, but it's hidden beneath the board and batten siding on the building in Fauquier County. Uh, so you see the before and after here, what this building looked like. And I love their name, the Warrington Antiquarian Society took on this, willingly took on this building and had professional advice uh, and rehabilitated it. And it's using it for interpretation. And I'll explain later how they're doing uh, research with it. And then what's called the Sanford Burgess Cabin in Stafford County. Thankfully, Stafford County did the right thing. And you can see what poor condition this building was in. And this is probably the last surviving log cabin, in, you know, for enslaved people in the, in the whole county. And so this has been, was first stabilized and then rehabilitated, which I didn't, unfortunately, show a slide of that. So when I say successes, I said this also shows the evolution of our project. Thankfully, we had money from the National Endowment of the Humanities early on, and we did uh, 12 buildings, did tree ring dating, dendrochronology. You can see the date ranges there, and also great for us, three of the buildings, we could dendro date two different stages of the building's constru construction. It turns out, what do you know, most slave quarters do not have very specific dates associated with them. I won't belabor this point, but through the 1860 U.S. Uh, census, we have evolved into other types of research, or you know, because it documents the issue of slave hiring, the hiring of enslaved workers uh, between white enslavers, and how common that was. We can also use those housing numbers to estimate enslaved household compositions, um, and also to look at the issue of white female enslavers through the census. So, you know, other types of interpretive research. Very happy to say we've had wonderful cooperation from Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Virginia, uh, so Virginia Humanities, and more specifically Peter Hedlund from Virginia Humanities, who's come out and he's done his panoramic uh, for photography in a number of buildings we looked at. He's also more recently included drone photos. So if you go to Encyclopedia Virginia's website and go to their virtual tours page and look for slave dwelling, you can do the you know, virtual tours of these buildings. We've also found evidence of late antebellum uh, changing construction practices, what we call hybrid construction, which are uh, mixing traditional timber framing with elements of balloon framing and also circular sawn lumber. In the old days, we saw circular sawn lumber. We say, oh, that's after the Civil War. Well, it's not. Uh, that lumber is available uh, in the late 1840s and into the 1850s and 60s. It reflects this sort of evolution of construction practices. And I'll have to say, this is something, again, we're so excited about is to see some of the buildings we've looked at connect with African-American descendants. Um, and again, it's the local citizens that have made this happen. So I mentioned uh, Weston earlier in Fauquier County. On their own, they went out and contacted descendants, have done oral histories with them. Uh, the same has happened in Fluvanna County. And then the two slides here, you might have heard of this episode and my colleague here, Sonia, had a lot to do with this. Uh, the plantation known as Sharwood in Pennsylvania County appeared on 60 Minutes. Dennis and I had our 15 minutes of fame. Uh, but most importantly, it told the amazing story of the Miller family. So these are descendants um, of the enslaved at Sharwood who have come to own. They own the plantation seat where their ancestors were enslaved. Uh, and they're doing amazing things. So I hope you will go to, uh, you can see the 60 Minutes episode on, on YouTube. 
So coming towards the end here and talk, you know, talking directly about archaeology, uh, why I want to emphasize this, what can we gain from archaeology for these buildings or the uh, slave housing in general? If you look at the, the, the blue section there, here's why. That we have no standing slave quarters from the 17th century, zero. And when I say a few, it's less than a handful from the 18th century. We don't have hardly any from the early 19th century. Most of the buildings we have are from the antebellum period. There's so much that we don't have that can only be achieved through archaeology. And so again, we get building plans, yard designs, landscape features through archaeology, and then obviously all these artifacts that we talk about enslaved peoples, their ways of life, their means of resistance, how they kept their cultural traditions alive. Think of all the issues that you can address through archaeology, uh, changing ethnic or cultural practices. So if you think about colonial wear and how that's been interpreted, issues of identity and gender and agency, all of this can come through archaeology as well as um, how, if you look at all these material goods, how did enslaved people obtain those? Uh, some were provided as rations, others were self-produced. Uh, liberated from their uh, enslavers, traded for, purchased, etc. Here's all these interpretive issues that are possible. And to sort of illustrate that in this last couple of slides, when we go into the interiors of these buildings, um, we are always met with architectural puzzles because they've, if they have survived into the modern era, they have changed. They've been put to alternative uses. And so it's kind of disappointing uh, many people are like, oh, you're inside. What do you see? What do you see from the period of slavery? What was life like in these buildings? And it turns out there's limited survival of period evidence for obvious reasons, these later modifications. So we can talk about certain aspects, and these are important aspects, like the dimensions of rooms, where the spaces were heated or not, how many windows, what kind of doors, stairs, the finishes of walls. But I said, it's a pretty stark I think if you look at these images, it's a pretty stark result. So we can see some modifications by enslaved people. So later wall finishes, uh, various uh, devices, nails and hooks and pegs for hanging items. We see a few closets that were added and obviously straightforward things like subfloor pits and root cellars that archaeologists are, are familiar with. But I said, otherwise, we're struggling. Again, why we need, I'll say it one more time, archaeology. Uh, I won't go through this list that you see here of all things. Think about repopulating these interiors with material culture, but importantly, that really makes these spaces come alive with the pe enslaved people that were in them um, and what they had and you know, really to fill these spaces. So finally, I just want to say, in terms of future research needs, and again, we are, Dennis and I can't do all of this, and we are appealing to others to take up these charges as I just said, we need ar architectural information from archaeological sites if we want to talk about slave housing from these earlier time periods. Dennis and I cannot get to every single county in, in Virginia, so I've listed areas where we definitely need um, more, more work, so the Eastern Shore and Southwest Virginia and so on. Uh, we need intensive architectural surveys in Virginia cities and towns. People don't, when you think about slavery, most people immediately translate that into plantation slavery for obvious reasons. But again, in all of Virginia cities and towns, there were enslaved people and therefore slave housing. And then last but not least, uh, we realized what we need to do is those, you know, those buildings that were earlier uh, surveyed back in the 60s through their early 2000s is we need to go back to those counties, look at those inventories and say, okay, do those buildings actually survive and, or in what condition are they? So that's my talk, and I thank everybody for listening. Uh, and just a few acknowledgments here at the end. Thank you so much. Doug. That is, um, I, I've heard you speak on this project before, and I've seen the sixty minute special, and it's just still, um, it's still so interesting and fascinating, and amazing yeah. to see what's still out there uh, to discover too. Mm -hmm. so. And uh, more discussion to come at the end for those who want to uh, uh, have some discussion time. All right, up next, we have uh, Sonia Ingram, who is the Chief Operating Officer at the Danville Museum of Fine Arts and History. I think I got that right. Um, 
Okay. Uh, director. Great. And um, she will be giving a presentation on uh, working with descendants of the historic African American community of Stokesland in Danville in Pennsylvania County, Virginia. Great. I'm going to go ahead and share the screen and get going here. Okay. Um, so uh, I became involved in preserving a an African American community um, called the Stokesland African American Community in Danville, Virginia. And actually, part of it is in Pennsylvania County. And you can see it with this red circle here where it's located. Um, so Danville, of course, is in the far southern part of the state on the North Carolina border. And in this area, the Stokesland African American community is really close to the North Carolina border and, and kind of goes across the border a little bit. And this is just a, a, an image of some of the folks that I've been working with. Um, here's another image. So the first, the reason that I became involved uh, with this community really was because of a, a cemetery and it was because it was it's sorry it's because it's called the Flippin Cemetery. Um, the Afri there's a nonprofit called the Southside African American Cemetery Preservation Society and they formed in 2014 to work on this cemetery and to really clean it up and this is what this cemetery looked like really back in 2014 uh when i got involved so it was a dumping ground for at least 50 years yeah this is just another image of some of the folks in the the organization and a lot of these folks had had moved away really during the the great mig migration but after they had retired they moved back to danville and they were really appalled about uh, what they had seen as far as this, the Flippin Cemetery, but also the, their community in general. So we started having some cleanup days. This is Danville Boy Scout Troop 300. Um, and we, we made a lot of progress here. There's a couple of more images of some of the cleanup days. And this is what it looked like afterwards. Um, the cemetery had been in use really in, until the 1950s. We we still don't know uh, when the first interment was, so we're not sure how old the cemetery is, but we do know that it was used up until the 1950s. And this is just an image of some of the, the grave markers. So. You have a variety of grave markers. You have the inscribed grave markers. You have at the the bottom here, you can see some of the temporary markers that funeral homes usually provide. And then also we had just field stone markers. And some of the graves, the field stones were missing and there were just the impressions, depressions in the ground. So you may recognize that as Brian Bates in the background. Um, it, Brian came out after we had done a lot of the cleanup and he volunteered his time to map a lot of these graves. And some of the ones that you see here are, are in the older part of the cemetery where there were just field stone markers and, and depressions. <laughs> These are a couple more images. This is Brian and uh, that's Brian's son. And that's my son there. And my <laughs> my son now is about two feet taller than that now. <laughs> so this is a map that, that uh, Brian made. Um, and this is very common. What we, we originally thought there were around a hundred graves, but um, once we started doing the cleanup work, we, real, we realized there were many more. <laughs> 
And at this point, we found at least 274 graves. So I just want to back up a little bit now, though, and talk about a big obstacle um, that we ran into while we were doing all of this work, all the cleanup work and all the mapping. The entire time that, that we were doing this, the, the nonprofit did not own the cemetery, and we did not know who owned the cemetery. Um, we tried to find out who owned the cemetery. <laughs> we had a fairly recent survey map, as you can see here. Um, the cemetery had been surveyed, but it was sort of lumped into a, another parcel. Um, the people that owned that parcel had a completely different survey that showed that they did not own the cemetery. <laughs> so um, it was a big mystery. Um, so everything we had done up to that point, we were basically trespassing. In order to, as you know, I mean, in order to apply for grants, in order to do really anything um, to a, to save a historic resource, you have to you have to own it. And um, so we actually the Virginia Outdoors Foundation stepped in and they helped. This is the image on the left. Uh, the Virginia Outdoors Foundation came in and they really did help. They provided um assistance through their land use attorney pro bono assistance he spent hours um, of doing a lot of deed research and survey research and mapping uh probably about twenty thousand dollars worth of research uh, for free to figure out who owned the cemetery and the man with the camera in the middle turned out to be the owner of the cemetery and he had <laughs> no idea that he owned it. <laughs> um, but it worked out well because uh, his name is Barry Copeland. He's a, he was on the historical society and he was a preservationist. So he actually donated uh, the land to the nonprofit. And these are just a few more images of the group. So, I do want to talk now just about the larger community. I mean, that's about the cemetery, but this really is about the larger Stokesland African-American community. Um, this is a, a an aerial uh, screenshot that I took of um, in Google Images, Google Maps, and um, it kind of gives you an idea of the Stokesland African-American community. Um, very generalized boundary, really. But if you look closely, you can see that it looks, it's kind of developed. Um, there are, uh, it, it, at one point, this was all residential. Um, there are three main historic resources in this community. Uh, there is the Flippin Cemetery, there's a Stokesland Rosenwald School, and then there's the Prospect Missionary Baptist Church. But what happened is in the 60s and 1970s or so, this entire area was zoned commercial and industrial. <clears throat> and at that point, um, a lot of this area, I don't have a pointer, so I can't really point these out, but um, after it was zoned commercial and industrial, you you have uh, warehouses, um, there's a building supply company, the trucking company came in, uh, built a beer distributor, there's a flooring company, a tire company. So a lot of the, the residents, the residents were um, demolished to make way for, for these um, industries. Um, So if you're driving around the Stokesland African-American community, this is sort of what you'll see. On the top left, that is the flooring company. <laughs> On the bottom there, you see the trucking company. There's a lot of chain link fences. I mean, you know, there is, um, it doesn't really look like a, a residential community at all, but all of this at one time were residents. 
But in and amongst all of the commercial and industrial development, you have this uh, on the top there, that's the Stuxland Rosenwald School. And um, to the right is the historic image of the school before there's a, currently there's a brick facade so on it. So it does look a little different. But um, below you can see there's a, um, what we think is a, um, a store. Uh, this is a railroad bridge across the Dan River. This is a little bit outside of the community, but still, we're still trying to determine the actual boundaries of the, the and these are just a few images that folks have sent us. This is just some of the people that have lived in that area and all their houses have been demolished over the years. And this is a little bit of information about the Prospect Missionary Baptist Church. So this gets into another obstacle and that's the obstacle of integrity. So when it comes to preserving these African-American communities, um, in this case, it's because of the, the zoning that happened later, the new development, um, the demolition, uh, the integrity of this African-American community, a lot of the integrity anyway, has been lost. The community would like to have this uh, the Sex on the African American community listed on the National Register of Historic Places, but it's probably going to be an uphill battle for us because a lot of that integrity has been lost. But really, when when we're talking about the integrity and about this area, one of the really the main what's been really difficult is convincing the locals and especially the lo the Danville, um, the city government, the local city government, that this was an African-American community. They um, have been reluctant to believe the people that still live here and that this, because of that integrity issue, because so much has been lost. So we had to do a little bit more digging. <laughs> And um, really, uh, we just did a uh, a very brief search on oldnewspapers.com, and it was pretty amazing what we found. Um, this was just one of the uh, newspaper articles that we found, but right away it shows that you know talking about Stokesland, this was a voting precinct. So they're talking about it was a strong Negro voting precinct. And the more that we researched, the more interesting it, it became, really. Um, as it turned out, um, Stokesland, what, well, definitely was an African-American community, but it was really important community, uh, precinct after Reconstruction um, after really the readjuster party, um, when the Virginia Virginia um, General Assembly was working to disenfranchise African American voters, uh, so we found a lot of information here, and we are now working on a historical marker to include all of this information. And we have finally been able to convince the city government that this is. <laughs> an African-American community. So, um, and this is just a little bit, some more information about the community. But um, we also found some more information about some uh, violence that took place here in Stokesland and some, um, you know, some near, um, I don't know if you call it riots, but some near riots that nobody has ever really talked about in Danville. So um, we were really happy to see because uh, uh, we have a casino now coming in Danville and that has uh, caused a lot of changes, good changes, I would say, in the planning 
department. And um, so just recently we've noticed, and I don't know if you can see this or not, but at the top right, uh, there is a trail connection to the Flippin Cemetery <laughs> that has been added to some of the new planning. And that was huge for us. You know, the community, we were just dumbfounded and, and happy because uh, they were actually uh, recognizing that this was a community. So anyway, that's it. We're happy to take questions. Thanks a lot, Sonia. And um, thanks a lot, Doug. We really appreciate Oops. nobody can see me. We really appreciate uh, you both uh, presenting tonight. Those are fantastic uh, studies. And um, I think we're we're definitely going to have some questions. I know I have some questions um, for you, but I'll open it up to other folks first. Um, uh, does anybody have any questions? You can feel free to uh, you know, to go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and ask a question. And if we get too many folks, I'll, uh, we can start doing a hand raise thing, but uh, <laughs> just, uh, yeah. If, if anybody has a question, please go ahead and, and ask. I'm happy to start it off. Um, Sonia, I had a question, <laughs> something that kind of hit me at the end of your presentation um, sure. was, um, you know, you were talking about the National Register, National mm -hmm. Register of Historic Places, mm -hmm. um, and how it was going to be sort of a struggle to figure out. You know, mm -hmm. how are we going to demonstrate integrity, just given the history and especially mm -hmm. the owning history of this place? Um, do you think, um, you know, sort of this case study demonstrates a weakness in the National Register um, and how it it defines uh, integrity and what you have to establish um, to, to, to sort of pr prove integrity of a place? I do, yeah, I do. Um, when I was at Preservation Virginia, we were involved in uh, working on PIFs for a few other African-American communities. One was Union Grove in Buckingham County um, another was the Pine Grove community in Cumberland County. And both of those, definitely African-American communities, but both have struggled with, you know, the PIFs were approved, but as far as getting the, the full nomination, they've both struggled. And one of the main uh, issues has been integrity. So I do think there needs to be some discussions <laughs> about um, the National Register uh, criteria, you know, um, definitely, definitely do you think there needs to be some discussions about that? Um, yeah. Gotcha. Any other questions? <laughs> We're not overwhelmed. <laughs> Well, Doug, I've got a question for you. Okay. Um, this may, this is, you know, your topic is not an area that I've studied. So I hope this doesn't come across as a naive question, but um, uh. I know um, in a lot of these circumstances, the slave owners were constructing the houses for the enslaved, but are there circumstances where the enslaved were uh, building their own houses and um, it, do you, you know are those um, are there existing examples of those that you've identified if if they were at times constructing their own uh, no no we haven't uh, again it's a little bit difficult to determine exactly I mean we do have to be clear that in most cases we can tell that the enslavers you know they're determining where these buildings are placed uh often you know the scale the dimensions and the materials the, the amount of investment uh, uh obviously in many cases determine the occupants um but keep do keep in mind that in most cases especially on these larger plantations you're having enslaved carpenters you know masons at work uh so they're you know constructing including there's a um, looking over here at Bath, you know, Monticello where you know Jefferson says you know is described his slave carpenters as like 
take three days and build, was it Krita, I think, uh, a log cabin. Wow. Uh, yep. So yeah. that, that it, it can be as direct as that. But I mean, if you, but I said to say that, oh, uh, you know, X number of slaves, are they just given the ability to, like, you know, go off and construct their own buildings? We don't have direct evidence of that. Um, but I said they're often the builders of, of the. Um, and then I said, what we do see is there, there truly is negotiation about these buildings, including in terms of the occupants, um, also, you know, what activities uh, take place. Um, so in many cases, enslavers are doing what they think is necessary uh, to, you know, from their point of view, to keep workers, you know, quote, I don't know, it's not you know, the appropriate word, you know, ha happy, contented, you know, less likely to resist. Um, and so in some cases, they are able to negotiate uh, conditions or being able to live with, uh, you know, people of their family or uh, kin, kin related, you know, people um, in, in, the, in these cases. And then what's interesting is we have very few period descriptions of owners and or overseers going into these buildings. Uh, so they do become private spaces of a kind. Uh, I often refer to as, you know, crossing a cultural threshold to go inside. Again, it comes back to why archeology span is so critical here. Um, we see that they are obviously affecting what sort of material culture is there and what their yards are like, et cetera. Um, Great. Yeah. Uh, Doug, I see here there's a question from Lauren Stevens who's asking, um, what was the reaction from the owners uh, or the public while you do your, you're doing your um, surveys of the slave housing? What sort of reactions have you gotten? Yeah, I will say it's been overwhelmingly positive. Um, and obviously we cannot go on people's property without their permission, uh, but people have been overwhelmingly positive ab ab about this. And so we've always had um, good cooperation. Where it gets a little, you know, quote, more interesting or awkward is what should happen to these buildings? Um, in some, some cases it is about money and other people, um, you know, they feel awkward. I mean, except in like the case of Sharswood, we have always dealt with white owners um, for, for these buildings. And some feel understandably awkward about, okay, what is my responsibility here? Uh, what should I do with this building? You know, do people want to come here, et cetera? So I said, we see a range of reactions, but thankfully it's, it's been positive. And some people are like, yeah, how can I reach out? How can I think about contacting descendants, et cetera? Um, so, so in that sense, we've been greatly, greatly encouraged by this. Um, we've got, we've got two questions from Patrick um, here. He's got the first one's for Doug, the second one's for Sonia. Uh, Doug, can you speak to how common it is through your research for emancipated families to continue occupying quarters and how can archaeology help us sort this out? Well, uh, we know that happens. Um, and sometimes in very direct ways. We looked at one example in Hanover County where thankfully the current owner uh, had a pay book of former you know, enslaved people who then become wage workers. Um, and we can tell pretty much they're in the same buildings. Um, they just had become wage workers. And he had, a, he had a, what was called a pay book, uh, period pay book where the, uh, the white owner was, you know, paying, you know, now free blacks um, in these cases. And that's, um, I'm really glad to have this question asked. Um, there's obviously more history to these buildings than just the period of slavery. Uh, that's obviously what we're mostly focused on. Uh, but in many cases, they are occupied by, you know, free blacks immediately after the Civil War and then on into later time periods of African Americans. And again, it's straightforward archaeological methods, right? That, okay, what artifacts are there? What time periods do they represent? Uh, but we've seen this in other cases. That one image I showed, I don't know if people remember, Walnut Valley, uh, which is now part of um, Chip Oak State Park uh, down there. Uh, we did, we also did archaeology there, you know, combined it with the, the architectural investigation. And we knew 
that African Americans after the period of the Civil War were living there and found you know artifacts from all those different periods. Uh, so they're they're there, and, and again, we, we need that sort of archaeological interpretation. Yeah, but anyway, I said, but we also see you know, for instance, uh, and I'll just make this point quickly, and then turn to some you know, but um, many of these duplexes go from being two enslaved household to one black household where they cut doorways through the partitions. Um, they might enclose one fireplace and no longer use that. If there were two stairs, you know, one in each room to go up to the garret, they'll take one stair out. Um, so we see a real pattern of how these buildings are altered in the period after slavery as well. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Sonia, uh, Patrick's question to you, urban renewal in Danville, what was mm -hmm. the impact on African American communities? Urban renewal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it um decimated uh entire communities. Um there's a in Danville, there is a, a freeway that sort of cuts across the city, really. It's called Central Boulevard, and that freeway was built. I don't know, 1956 or so. And that, it it um, destroyed, hu uh, well, it destroyed one entire African-American community and then it fragmented several others. Um, so yeah, I mean, there there's, a, there's one African-American community in Danville called Almagro that has uh, luckily uh, survived uh, very much intact but many of the others have not. Um, and uh, certainly Stokesland has not, not because of highway construction, but because of the zoning. Um, uh, so yeah, yeah, Danville has, uh, African-American communities in Danville really have suffered uh, greatly. Yeah. And where did it sort of, when the, when the zoning changes took place, Mm -hmm. And that looked like it was kind of more like in the middle of the densest area, maybe of the what the community. Did mm -hmm. th that kind of push folks just further out from sort of the core of the community into the, you know, outskirts of town sort of? Um, and I'm kind of leaving a lot of, of information out here, but um, there were several things that came into play. Um so around the same time you had uh, the Danville Golf Club was built really close to the Stoke, in, well, in Stokesland. Um, and uh, the school field, school field is a, a, a textile mill and it was a complete community. And that was built not far from Stokesland. And when those two, um, developments occurred a lot of white people moved in and that really pushed a lot of black people out um that uh, that occurred be, uh prior to the rezoning so i think you know by the time the rezoning happened a lot of black people had already moved out to the community um and it was already pretty much becoming a white community in a lot of ways. So by the time the rezoning had happened, you know, it was, um, it, it changed a lot. Yeah. Gotcha. Do you have any more, any more questions from, from anyone? I was going to ask, um, I think this was in, the news as well but i um i have seen places that are listed on like airbnb and um you know vrbo and they're you know they sometimes say like the servant's house um in these larger estates and things um have you been able um so this is for doug in the in the project have things popped up that way um, that you guys have found at all? Or, you know, have you been able to like contact landowners and be like, hey, this is not what you think it is? Um, <laughs> um, well, a couple of different I mean, I mean, one, we have disappointed some owners where we said, 
we don't think this is a play quarter. Um, so th that that does happen. Uh, now we're very very familiar. Like I said, I, I mentioned in my talk uh, this uh, again. Have to come back. This is private property. People can do what they want with their private property. Um, we wish they wouldn't, um, but that again, this is where I think more public outreach and education is needed. Uh, but I said a number of these, uh, especially where more wealth is involved, they become these you know, sort of upscale guest cottages and have been usually severely altered. Uh, so mm -hmm. in some cases, we'll walk in, you know, we have visited some of these buildings and we walk into the inside and there's nothing to document. It's all it's all gone, except maybe the basic room dimensions. But material, you know, historic finishes, other other, you know, material elements, they're just gone. Um, so in a way, we've stopped in doing this, uh, going to these guest cottages, because we just don't, we're not really learning anything. They they do sort of become shells or facades of former slave quarters in that way. And I know in some cases it was not intentional on the owner's part, you know, to quote, to destroy history, et cetera. But we realized that's, you know, that's the loss we're, look, we're looking at. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, And I know in some cases there has been a public reaction to this. You know, practice where you know on a commercial level you can stay in former quarters um, and saying this is not appropriate um but I, I know it still occurs you know and then as you said advertised on that basis right i should say i think that's a good point that just people need to be more aware um and right. you know, public engagement yeah so once again these initiatives are really good go ahead chris um, Doug Crystal uh, has has a question. Um, have other researchers undertaken similar studies in other states? Um, are there any that you know of? You know, similar documentation studies of quarters. No, we're the best. Uh, <laughs> we know that. Uh, uh, yes and no. Not many states have, especially at a state level. And again, we have to be clear. You know, Dennis and I are doing this on a part-time basis over all these years. We just can't get everywhere. I uh, don't, don't have time and money, you know, for for that. So are we statewide? Y yes and no. I mean, you've looked at a lot, but certain regions have not. Um, I know some work has taken place in Louisiana on this. Um, Tennessee did sort of an inventory of, you know, what's in their state files. Uh, but no, I haven't seen, we haven't seen similar efforts. Um, I mean, I think ours obviously, one reason it has achieved because we just have done it this long, uh, which has allowed us to eventually get to a, a number of places. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised uh, that it hasn't taken place, but I think, I know in Louisiana and I think a little bit in Alabama, have you got? Have you and and Dennis reached the spot in your research where you're going back and taking a look at the first dwellings you looked at at the beginning of the study and seeing how they're faring? Or, well, I mean, we've tried to keep t keep tabs on them. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I think what's more important is what I mentioned right at the end. Is I said, you know, we we did this for Clark County in the northern Shenandoah Valley where we had, again, good local contacts. We said, okay, let's go see how many buildings. There's about 30 on file, and let's go back to those buildings today. We're happy to say most of them do survive. Uh, a couple turned out not to be slave quarters. Uh, but that level of research really needs to be done because that, that 1,500 number that I threw out at the beginning, it may be substantially lower if these buildings don't, don't survive. Uh, it just depends what condition they're in as well. So that's really uh, some of the you know, the hardcore field research that needs needs to be done, and we're hoping, you know, Dennis and I might be able to do a little bit of that, but you know, but, that other people will take up that charge, uh, and because uh, as I tell, uh, Sonia had made a real difference for us in Pennsylvania County. It all comes down to knowing local citizens, local contacts, and who, who know the property owners, who know where these buildings are uh, that really determines the success of how much you say okay we're going to look at county x or city x and, and and do something you know sort of comprehensive or on a sampling basis that makes sense yeah 
Anybody else? Tell Crystal she needs to do Almoral County. <laughs> <laughs> we do it, Crystal. <laughs> of course she will. I'm sitting on the floor cutting out Halloween costumes, so I can't oh. do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, Chris, Albemarle County has one of the highest numbers of okay. uh, highest inventories. It's like 40 some buildings, which is pretty amazing. Uh, wow. But again, but again, how many of those survive and in what condition is still not known? Up in the air. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some counties literally have zero on file with the department. I think there's like five or six counties that have no slave buildings on file with the DHR, which we know just, you know, work. There's been no surveys. Uh, hadn't been right. looked at. Um, most counties are sort of in that 10, 12, maybe to 20 buildings. Yeah. And when you go into an urban area like Richmond, are you able to sort of establish that you can sort of get in there and identify all of the existing? <laughs> or is well, it, I don't, it doesn't I don't know about work that like that? Yeah, no, the, the, the toughest part about urban that we've learned is that there's such a prim, uh, primacy, primacy on space in urban areas that if these buildings five, you know, the sort of what we refer to as outbuildings or back buildings on these urban lots, they've been put to some other use. Uh, they're usually not just neglected, like sometimes you see in rural areas. Um, so in some cases have pretty good idea of where these buildings are, but you know, actually find the specific buildings and determine their interior condition is is critical. But that's what's needed in, in places. And I also want to say towns i don't want to leave those out so smaller cities towns as well courthouse towns there was slave housing in all of these towns slash city environments um and it's just something that architectural historians and archaeologists have not looked as much as uh surprisingly historians have paid more attention to mm -hmm. urban slavery yeah All right, any, any other questions out there? All right, well, Doug and Sonia, we really uh, appreciate you uh, talking to us tonight. And um, those are some great presentations and we wish you the best of, of luck with your future research. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Yeah. Shout out to Ethel. Thank <laughs> <laughs>